The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we are coming to you live, uh, still from my office. Uh, sometimes we're in the studio and sometimes we're in my office, but we're in the new headquarters for the Autism Network, so I'm thrilled about that. And we've been doing a series this entire summer called Parent to Parent Talks, and because uh, my book Parent to Parent came out, where I just give you a parent perspective on things that we that you guys ask questions about and things that we hope can help you maybe today, uh, maybe even as early as today. Sometimes it takes a little preparation beforehand, but it's it's like the stuff that the common sense sort of, you know, get her done. So today we're going to be talking about bedtime rituals. So I hope, good morning, Amanda. Love to see your blue hearts. Um, Oh, I, well, you know, I we keep saying that we got to figure out how to do the shows on Instagram because Amanda says I'm missing you guys on Facebook because I'm spending more time on Instagram. I need to get on Instagram. I don't understand Instagram. I'm going to admit to that. Don't really understand TikTok or Twitter. I was like, what's the other one? Don't really understand any of them. But uh, I do understand websites that Traven is starting to show you some of the different places where you can see us. We do have an Instagram page, but we haven't been doing, I don't even know what they call them when you're live on Instagram. Uh, I think lives, I think that's what they're calling them. But anyway, we're right now we're live on a bunch of different places. We're live right now on Facebook, on YouTube, Twitter, uh, which I've already said that I don't understand. <laughs> about a dozen other sites. So I, I hope that you'll get the content where you need it, when you need it. Remember that everything is archived video and sound on YouTube. We podcast the show and it is available wherever you get your podcasts free. Uh, we aren't on the ones that cost money, but we are on the ones that are, that are free. So, um, but what we've done recently, a couple of months ago, is that we changed our format so that when you get the podcast, it comes only in audio. Uh, and so if you want the video podcast, you do need to go to YouTube. We really want you guys um, to make that your home when you're finding video because YouTube has made it easier for you. You can even get that on your TV now or on your phone. So we hope that you will do that. Uh, good morning to Laurie. So thrilled that you are here with us. And don't forget to like and share as Traven is reminding us right now. We really love it when you do that. In fact, it, we, you know, it's a personal favorite of mine when you give us a review on iTunes. That I don't know why, but that helps us to get to more people than anything else. And that's really what we want to do here. As you know, if you watch the show, our, our mission is to provide information and inspiration to anybody who needs it in a free format whenever they can find it. So I hope that you'll help us in that mission because we don't spend a lot of money. We spend so little money. It's embarrassing on marketing. Uh, what we count on is grassroots marketing that you'll share, that you'll like, that you'll tell somebody else that if you know another autism parent, you know, and you're friends with them on Facebook, you can put their name in the Facebook right now, and then they won't have to go looking for it. Then they'll know, oh, I come here, I see this, maybe this is helpful to me. Uh, okay, so thrilled that you, but that thrilled that those of you who are with us live watching it, if you're watching this recorded and you're like, well, I would have liked to have asked a question, you can always write in on our website. Um, if you go to autismnetwork.com, that's where everything is, autismnetwork.com. But once you get there, you can go to the top and it says podcast because we're starting different podcasts. If you click on the one that's Autism Live, it will take you directly to the Autism Live website, the old one, which is autism-live.com. Um, you can leave a comment there. Um, it is not interactive in real time, but you can leave a comment so that we can answer it on a subsequent show, or you can write to me. Uh, and my email is shannon at autism-live.com. Shannon 
at autism-live.com. Now, here's the thing about writing to me is that I try to be really good and get back to everybody. And it's so funny to me when I write back to people who are like, am I actually talking to you? Yes, you're actually talking to me. Um, and sometimes I am not a genius with my email and stuff gets by me. So if I don't answer you pretty quickly, I mean, within 24 hours, you probably should resend it because it might be getting lost in a busy day. I just keeping it real. That's the truth. But I do try to get back to you if you email me, shannon at autism-live.com. And sometimes the other thing that I do is if I know that it's something that I got to refer to an expert and I know which expert to refer to, sometimes uh, depending on how much personal information you put in, I might ask you, can I refer this to an expert? And sometimes if there isn't personal information that identifies you, I just share it with them. And sometimes I forget to tell you that I've shared it with them. So, uh, and that I'm waiting for their answers. So don't be afraid in any case, you're not bothering me. Send me another email so that I make sure that you get the information that you need. Cause that's my mission, what I'm on. The, as, if you know, if you watch the show, I'm a proud pony, a parent of a neurodiverse individual. And so when he was diagnosed and at my darkest moments, when I was, you know, uh, kneeling on the bedroom floor, crying and sobbing to, you know, everything that was holy and saying, please help me. Uh, the bargain that I made was help me to find my way and then I'll do whatever I can to help whoever I can. That's what I said. That's what I meant. That's what I'm trying to do. That's the walk I'm walking. Laurie, you wrote an email. Oh, you sent it on Friday. Okay. Well, I wasn't here on Friday, but I don't remember seeing it. So resend because sometimes things get just don't have to redo anything. Just copy and paste and resend it to me because I did not see it. Um, so I appreciate you telling me that because I hate it when I don't get back to people. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. We're, we're going to get started with this. I think I covered everything. Didn't I, Traven? Is there anything? I, here's the thing. Here's the disclaimer. We always like to invite experts to be here on the show and we love having experts. I am always honest with you guys and say, I am not an expert. I'm not an expert in autism. I'm about to talk about bedtime rituals and I'm going to tell you, I am not an expert in bedtime rituals. But I am somebody who has interviewed a lot of experts and I've been through this with, with my kid and helped other parents to get through this. So I'm not an expert. Let's be very clear about that. But I do know some things that might help you to figure out and, you know, in your circumstance, some things to look at. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do. And, and my particular talent is putting it in a way that you can understand without all the jargon, right? That's my particular thing. And so I do have some experience, strength, and hope to share this morning about bedtime rituals. So I hope that it will be useful to you. I will tell you, we're going to go through this ra rather quickly, but I want you guys to be writing in questions and specific problems. There, We will get to a point where we talk about troubleshooting. You might find your answer along the way, and I might save the answers, uh, the questions, um, and answers to the end it will depend on what comes in and where, because I might look at it and go, oh, you know, that's going to fit when we're on slide three. Uh, so bear with me on this, right? But keep asking the questions. If I don't answer your question right away, don't think, well, she's not answering questions today, because I absolutely would love some specific questions about bedtime rituals. But here's what I want you to know, that we're, we're calling this bedtime rituals, nighttime success. Uh, first of all, it's not one size fits all, right? Um, but almost everybody has some issues around nighttime. Almost everybody. And almost everybody has them with almost every child. So right out the gate, I just want to remind you, this is not because you're a mess. This is not because your child can't learn. This is not even necessarily because of autism, right? Uh, it's not your fault. And I also want to empower you um, to understand that we can change the nighttime ritual. Because here's the thing. Success is what we all want. And, and you know, I don't know why we didn't do this one first, because I think this is pretty important. That if you aren't getting rest and your child isn't getting rest, all the things that you might be trying to do, you might make some success at some of them, right? Because you're working really hard and because, you know, you've got good help and support. 
but you will never make the success that you would have made if people have, you know, um, a better nighttime. Um, so let's, let's start this right from the beginning. Um, that I want to fill your backpack with hope because you absolutely can change the nighttime ritual. You can change the routine, whatever it is that you have going on right now. And you might be completely upside down where your, your kid isn't sleeping for three days because God love you. I know that there are some of you out there where that is the situation where your child gets all wound up and is awake for three. I know people who have teenagers that sometimes they'll stay awake for six days. Um, and you might think to yourself, we've been doing this so long. There's absolutely no way we can change it. And I, I have to tell you based on my life and what I've heard from experts and what I've heard from other family members, I, I feel very confident in telling you that you can change the routine sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, but you absolutely can change this routine and it can get better. But here's the big, big asterisk that you have to be well-rested enough to do the intervention. Oh my gosh, this is the hardest thing in the world, right? Uh, and I know that when we, when my son was diagnosed with autism, we were upside down in about 12 different ways. And we, they told us that we could get ABA, which I initially said no to. And then, you know, people changed my mind about that. And so then in order to get it in the state of California at that time, first you and your husband or your significant other had to do a 16 hour training that was at specific times and you had to both be present at the same time. And I feel like part of the reason why they did that was that they were separating who's serious about this and who isn't because the only way that I was able to do that um, was that I had a really good friend from college who is the best person I know with kids say, you know, I'm coming to Los Angeles and I don't have anything to do for two weeks. Um, is there any way that I could help you? <laughs> How lucky am I? Right. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. I'm, you know, let me pay you, but I need for you to be with my child for these 16 hours while I go to this class. Right. Otherwise we would never have had ABA. Um, but I lucked out. Then when we got to the class, the instructor said, you know, I want you to daydream for just a minute about if we could change three things about what's going on in your life right now, what would related to your child, what would those three things be? And I, of course, wrote down that I, I would like for him to go to sleep at regular hours because we were having the only way that he could go to sleep was that we were driving him in the car, in his car seat. And it would take sometimes an hour or two. And, and often he would not go to sleep until around three o'clock in the morning. So I would be out driving the streets tired at 2 a.m. trying to get my child to go to sleep. And the thing, all children are different, right? But my child, once he went to sleep, you could, you know, hold him by his ankles and, you know, have dogs lick his face and he would not wake up. Forget it. He was asleep. That would be it. And he would sleep for a period of time, right? But getting him to sleep was crazy hard. But I could have him go to sleep in the car and then I could take him out of his car seat and take him upstairs because our parking was below our condo. And he would not wake up. Now, some of you, you can get the child to sleep in the car seat, but then you go to move them and they wake up, right? We all have our different issues. But I wrote that down first on the list. And then second on the list, I wrote, uh, actually, I think first I wrote down that my son was hitting his head on the kitchen floor. And I wrote down that the sleep thing. And I, of course, the third thing was I want him to be able to talk, right? I think some of you can relate to where I was on that day. And, um, you know, what was interesting was that in that 16 hour class, the guy wanted to work on the sleep thing, which I thought was interesting. And then when we, then after the 16 hours, we started ABA and they said, we're not going to work on the head banging until you get the sleep thing under control. And the guy at the, with the 16 hour class had given us some good information, which I'm going to share with you here, but it wasn't really until the ABA provider impressed upon me oh no, you got to make this the priority. 
This has to be the priority because if you don't get sleep, then we're not going to be able to do the rest of the interventions. And they said, this has got to be the most important thing that I had to be well rested. Now, here's the thing. Already I've lost some of you. You're like, well, I'm not going to be well rested because I can't be well rested. And because my kid this and my kid that sometimes this means calling in reinforcements. So I had to have the college friend come so that I could go to the 16 hour class. And I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have her. And yes, I got incredibly lucky that she was in town at that period of time. But I got to tell you, sometimes we don't know how lucky we can be until we put it out there to our friends. And sometimes to start these interventions, to be well rested enough, you have to say to a friend, is there any way that you could come over and be with my child for three hours while I nap, because I know I'm going to be up late tonight working on this bedtime ritual. And you don't know until you ask, and I'm going to ask you to steal yourself because it, it's hard to ask because some people are going to say, no, I just can't, right? But you don't know until you ask. So be willing to ask. But you have to be well rested. Now, if you're in a couple situation, you know, it's, it might be easier, but a lot of times work gets in the way. You might have to take a couple of days off uh, and say to your partner, you sleep because in two days we're going to hit this hard and I need one of us to be rested, right? Um, you do what you have to, but just know it's going to be bumpy for a little while and then it's going to get better. But you can read what this slide says. You can change the nighttime ritual but you need to be well rested yourself. And Amanda says, absolutely. This is one of the things I've been fortunate enough to have under control at an early LA age. A lot of that was thanks to this show and OT. Fantastic. I'm so thrilled to hear that. Okay. So moving this along here, once we get it, because I want you to have the idea that it can be changed. So first thing we want to do to change the bedtime ritual is change the daytime ritual because the bedtime ritual really starts in the morning and it lasts all day long. So a couple of tips that I've given you here for your daytime ritual to set you up for success for a nighttime ritual is number one, reduce the sugar. Oh, I know. I just lost a bunch more of you, right? You're like, my life is miserable. My child loves sugar. It's how we get through the day. I'm not saying cold tur turkey it. And I'm not saying, notice I didn't say eliminate sugar. I'm saying reduce it. I just had my grandnieces. You may have noticed I wasn't here as much the last two weeks. I just had my grandnieces stay with me for 11 days. Teenage girls. And, uh, you know, I don't, the first few days that they were there, their parents were there with them and then their parents left and came back to get them later on. And I don't have a lot of sugar in my house and I forget that. Um, and the house guests come to my house and we cook meals and we do all these things. And then, uh, you know, it's like day two the people go, I need to go someplace where there's sugar because I can't, I, I got to have something sweet. Do you have anything sweet hidden someplace in your house? Right. And these two girls were like, you know, what do you mean you don't have sugar in your house? I just don't. Um, so, and then gradually as the 11 days went by, I saw how reinforcing it was for them that we would go for ice cream at night and they really loved that. Um, but I also witnessed how different they were on the sugar and how much harder it was to get teenagers to go to sleep on the sugar when we've gone for ice cream after dinner. Cause you know, that's not really setting yourself up for success. So reduce the sugar go be kind, do it slowly. Um, but I really noticed that I, I got a little tough on the, uh, eliminating artificial colors and flavors, and that might be a little hard for you. And again, people are like, I'm done and clicking this off. But if you really want to change the nighttime ritual, these are the things that I have found to be successful. Now, everybody's different. Each kiddo is different. And so that's why number three is eliminate foods that are triggering that some of our kids, you know, it can be lemonade that sets them off and we see that they're a little zippy or uh, I'm trying to think, well, obviously chocolate has caffeine in it. Right. But if you know that there are things that wire your kid up, 
then these are not the things that we want to have at all right now. Not even at noon. We want to like clean this up a little bit so that we're 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 working on a baseline where we can set up good sleep habits, right? Um, now, number four is to have fun. When, if you notice, like we also went to Disneyland over the 11 days and it's, a, it's amazing to me because everybody hates to go to bed, right? Except after you've been to Disneyland all day, everybody can't wait to go to bed because everybody's exhausted. Why? Because you've walked around, you've been in the sunshine, you've had fresh air and you had 68,000 kinds of fun, right? So when we make the day super duper fun for kids, it wears them out. And we really want them to be happy and worn out. That is one of the keys to success with the bedtime ritual. And you see number five, stay active. Um, in fact, you know, that's half the game is if you keep your kiddo active. Uh, that's why we say to you that physical activity is a great success strategy. Now, I don't want to be offensive to anybody, but I knew a woman when my son was little, 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 she was uh, a midwife and then became a doula and she amazing, amazing mom, right? She had these two boys that were always perfect gentlemen, always well-behaved, always well-adjusted, like, like just, I don't know. And I saw them in lots of different circumstances. And we would all say to her, Renee, what is your secret for these two, you know, happy, well-adjusted young men who are polite and listen and are calm, cool, collected, intelligent, polite mannered young men. And she would always say the same thing. She said, oh, you got to run them like dogs. Now, I know some of you are going to be like, we don't like the dog analogy. But I, I tell you the truth. This is what she said. Run them like dogs. She had her kids up in the morning and active and made sure that they had activity all throughout the day. They were on the swim team. Now, both of her kids were neurotypical, and this doesn't always apply to those of us who have kids that are on the spectrum, spectrum but... I want to tell you, and the reason why I put the running shoes up there is because we're aware of a family. We've had them before on the show. Uh, I want to say their last name is Schneider, and mom has written a book. Both sons are adults, and they're they're pretty impacted adults. They're nonverbal, and their life was really, you know, had a whole lot of challenges. And then they discovered that one of their sons, when he ran on a regular basis that he self-regulated like on an epic level um, to the point where they had him running marathons. And because he needed to run and somebody needed to run with him, I don't remember which one it was first, mom or dad who started running with him. And then there was a second, their other son also pretty impacted with autism. And they said, we're going to get him running. Now the whole family runs and the parents don't run as much or as far, but the two young men compete. They have, you know, sponsorships um, from, I, I don't know, one of the running shoes uh, and they regularly compete in marathons. But if you talk to the parents, they say self-regulation was an entirely different thing once we had them running on a regular basis. And I'm not talking just running a little, marathons are not running a little, right? But and I hope that we all learned, I certainly learned it and need to relearn it in COVID that for any of us, when we have physical activity, we self-regulate better. Now, how much physical activity? I don't know because everybody is different. We hear Temple Grandin talk to us about the fact that she needs a burst of physical activity at night in order to go to sleep. That, you know, she'll do like 20 jumping jacks in the hotel room to just, just enough so that it's this burst of, you know, whatever it does to the serotonin and whatever in her body. And she does it at a certain time every night because that she knows that's going to set her up for success. So I don't know what the amount is for you. And I don't know what the amount is for your kids, but I will say this, if you are having trouble with a nighttime ritual up the physical activity, and obviously you want to make sure that you're hydrating and watching your kiddo because we don't want them to get stress fractures or get overheated 
or be doing too much, but don't be afraid to push them into some physical activity. But what's key here is it has to be fun for them, right? Not everybody likes to run. Some people do. And some people like to run on a track and some people like to run on a trail. Other people, it could be as simple as swinging or a lot of our kids like to do a trampoline. This is physical activity and it gets things moving and it releases endorphins and it tuckers them out. And tuckered out is what we want. Amanda says, so interesting. My son does laps around the house at the same time every night before bedtime. And that might be that he's telling you this is what I need. We, um, my son loved to run. Oh my gosh, he loved to run and I just can't run. And I couldn't find anybody who would run with him on a regular basis. But when he got a little bit older, there was, we used to do a thing. We had stairs in our house and, and we would say to him, okay, we need you to do the stairs 20 times. And what, what we found was that he felt better um, because there's something to be said for it. So um, you'd be amazed at, at what our kids can do. And remember, it's not one size fits all. If you have a kiddo who struggles to um, be able to use their feet to move forward, perhaps it's swimming. Um, but, you know, make sure that they get lots of physical activity and you'll be on the right track. It Honestly, it's my number one tip for you today. Um, but we have more. But wait, there's more. Uh, okay, so now let's get down to the nighttime ritual. Now, this is what the guy in the 16-hour class basically lined out for me, that um, you, you got to start the nighttime ritual earlier, you know, uh, in the day. He was saying at about four o'clock in the day. But um, he was saying to normalize when dinner is, because we were doing it sometimes, you know, at five and sometimes at 630 and sometimes at 730. And he was like, let's make a ritual. Let's make a ritual. Let's do dinner at the same time. And let's make sure that we're doing dinner with no stimulants. In fact, he was pushing, you know, if there are things that my child likes to eat that are filled with tryptophan, you know, go for it. That if your kiddo likes, and, and by the way, there are times when we're working on one thing, but when we're working on the nighttime thing, let's work on the nighttime thing. Let's not worry about as much about other stuff as the things that fit the nighttime ritual, right? Because if your child is perhaps somebody who only eats potatoes and you're like, well, you know, I'm suggesting to you maybe mashed potatoes and you're like, well, we're trying to vary up the diet. I would say to you, let's get the nighttime ritual together and then let's vary up the diet. You know, don't put too much on yourself at the same time. So dinner with no stimulants, in fact, quite the opposite, um, that let's make sure that we set ourselves up for success. Things like turkey and mashed potatoes, think Thanksgiving, right? Are things that, you know, sometimes our kids need a certain level of carb, um, but some kids, too much carb converts to sugar and they're wired. So you, you got to find the balance with your kid. That's why I said no stimulants, not specifics here. Um, then after dinner, either bath or swim. I don't know what it is about water, but water calms the soul. Water almost always for our, our kids on the spectrum has a calming effect. Now, if your kid is panicked by baths, um, then some sort of bathing ritual where they wash themselves because what you're doing is setting up the ritual. It's kind of, it's classical conditioning um, that, you know, what we're going to set up is that in the future, as uh, when we get into the bedtime ritual, that they have this expectation that I know first comes this, then comes this, then comes this, and then I go to sleep. Right. And so part of that is going to be washing your face uh, brushing your teeth, right? Bathing though, having some sense of cleaning and water. But for a lot of our kids, if you have the ability to swim before bedtime, ooh, because that's also that physical activity thing, right? Then just like we talked about with the potty training the other day, we have special jammies. If you have the ability to um, get new jammies that are something, a character that they love, we want it all to be special, right? Um, if you don't have the ability to, because the budget doesn't allow for it, maybe they're, you know, um, 
we, we put a sticker on it, right? Um, something about that ritual, but it's this whole thing. I know people who will say to me, well, you know, we don't put them in pajamas because when they're tired, you know, it's just easier to put them to bed in their clothes, except that those are people who are generally having a problem with the nighttime ritual. So I'm suggesting, again, we make it this very ritualistic things. Our kids like rituals because it reduces anxiety. And, and we certainly don't want to have anxiety at bedtime, right? So we're setting up this first, we do this, then we do this, then we do this thing. So the special jammies, you know, we got to be in the jammies and then we have special time where I am suggesting to you that it's either read or sing, or it could be a video, but if it's a video, it's got to be very specific. What the guy in the 16 hour class told us to get was a very specific VHS video. And at this point it was almost all DVD. And so it was hard, to, but we had a VHS, but it was hard to get the VHS. And I think it was called nighty nights. And basically what it was, and I put it in the first time it was a half hour video. And I was like, what are we doing here? Because in the beginning it shows all of these animals, baby animals, and they're jumping around and they're doing all this stuff. And I was like, this is stimulating. What is this? But then the music changes at about 10 minutes in and all it starts to slow down a little bit and all the animals start to wind down a little bit and the last 10 minutes of the video is all of the baby animals laying down and very and you get to watch them close their eyes and go to sleep now i don't know if this video is available anymore or if you can find it on youtube but i'm telling you it was magic um, but I, I also would tell you that there are other things that you can do too, like reading or sleeping, just make it ritualistic, <laughs> excuse me, have a special chair or go in to their bedroom and do it and have them be all snuzzy in their bed. But this should be about comfort. This should be about special time. If your child likes snuggies, that we give them snuggies. It might be that, um, well, the next one is low key fun in bed. Um, so you could marry these two together. I do suggest that you make wherever it is that they're sleeping, something extra that is fun for them to go into that space, whether that is the, the perfect blanket or, a, you know, I mean, there's all different kinds of things that kids like that make bedtime better. And it's very individuals. It might be the, the special silky that they like to, or, or the um, stuffed animal, or it might be a nightlight or something that plays music, right. That they have the remote control for. But I, um, I sort of love it. When when my son was little, we did reading time and it was in a very special rocking chair. And that was where we would go and we would sit there and we would snuzz up. And he, at first, I've talked about this many times on the show, he would not sit to be read a book to. He just couldn't do it. And then my mom came to visit and she gave him an apple, a cold apple. He And he would like suck on it sometimes, but he never would even break the skin on it. Or maybe eventually he would take one bite out of it, but it wasn't about that. It was about holding something. I don't know why, but holding that cold apple in his hands, then he could focus on the story and be read a story to. And he loved being read to. Love, love, love being read to. Um, so, but set up this ritual for yourself. Just make sure, just like the video in the beginning when you're reading, make it really exciting and, you know, and have them be interactive and say, where, you know, where is the duck? Uh, and what, you know, and wh where's the dog in the picture or do you see, or what do you think is going to happen when they're a little bit older? Right. And make it really exciting. But as you're reading, slow down and be a little bit more gentle and, you know, calm yourself, just like in the video. So we start exciting so that we get their attention and then we lull them in. Do you know that there is this secret about sleep that if someone uh, were to lay next to someone who is sleeping, they, and if they match their breath to the person who is sleeping, they will go to sleep. It's one of the reasons why we all like to, you know, sleep with other people in the same bed. Um, but for kiddos, we can mimic that by slowing the pace down a little bit 
and and really lulling them into this sense of calm, right? Um, but we want to make sure that whatever we're doing during this time of reading and singing and the low key fun in bed, that it's, we're not turning on a disco ball and dancing on the bed. That is not this time of night, right? That would be much, much, much earlier. <laughs> and then, excuse me, we have to have a ritual for leaving because this is the hard part, right? How do you get out the room? How do you leave them in the bed and get out the room? And it's different at different phases for different kids. That right now, um, it might be that you have to stay in the bed with them until they go to sleep, and then you have to slowly extricate yourself and go out the door. And if that's what you need to do to get yourself in uh, yourself and your child into a bedtime ritual where they're going to sleep at a regular basis, then do that and stop berating yourself. Now, all the experts will tell you, and I've heard Dr. Grampiche explain to people so many times that you can, over time, you can start to fade yourself where it might be that, you know, you do, you do this for a week where your child is on this schedule and goes to sleep and you, and then once they're asleep, you slowly extricate yourself from the bed. And then next week, what you do is you move an inch over so that while they're getting ready to go to sleep, you're not, you know, you, maybe you're only touching like their arm, but the rest of you is not touching. So when you go and that week by week, you move yourself an inch further until finally, you know, you're out the door. Um, right. Uh, because a lot of you will write in and say, I, you know, I need to, um, be able to sleep in my own bed and you can just go slow, slowly, slowly, slowly fade yourself. Lori says, my son is wired, wired all day. When it comes to bedtime, I have to give my son melatonin. He goes to bed the same time, the same activities and so forth. If we go out, we make sure his bedtime ritual is the same. Recently, we found out he sleeps better when he eats about an hour prior. Fantastic. See, these are great things to know because everybody's a little bit different, but you've got his bedtime ritual and you've added some melatonin. We're going to talk about that in just a second here. Okay, moving on here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the bedtime pass. And I was going to see if I could find one for you guys. Um, there is this amazing tool that's called the bedtime pass. And this is an arts and crafts project for you or someone that loves you, that you make a thing and it's called the bedtime pass. And then um, you make little elements of it. So let's say that your child, because this one of the biggest things that you guys say is, well, I can get my child to go to bed, but then my child gets out of bed 32 times right? And we don't need for it to be that. And that's the most exhausting thing, right? You finally feel like, oh, I got my child to bed and now I can go watch TV or, you know, do work or do laundry or be with my significant other or just be or take a shower, right? And then the child gets up and, and we get frustrated, right? And then we walk them back to bed and it's this, this really like over and over thing that's frustrating. So the bedtime pass is meant to broadly cover a bunch of the reasons why our kids get up out of bed. So let's put on our Sherlock hats for just a minute and think to ourselves, why on earth would kids get out of bed? Well, sometimes they get out of bed because there's more light happening in the other room and they don't like the dark. Sometimes they get out of bed because of anxiety and because they'd rather be with us than be by themselves, right? And there's so many, so many, so many reasons why. So just for a couple of nights before you start doing this, take a take data. I know I always say that I'm never going to say this to you guys, but I do sometimes. This is when it's useful for you. So just get a piece of paper and every time your child gets out of bed, make a hash mark until they don't get out. Of, and it might be all night. It might be 32 times, right? But let's just get a number of what it is and take it for a couple of nights and then average them out. So you say, okay, Shannon, it's 32 times and bless you if that is what your circumstance is, right? Um, but if it is, then it's 32 times. So what you would do is you would think to yourself, okay, how do I want to do this? And I think most ABA providers would not tell you to make 32 of them, but you could. You make what, however many number tokens. We had a thing that said bedtime pass and it had little Velcro tickets on it. People do it with poker chips 
or with playing cards, whatever. But however many bedtime passes you want there to be, um, you give them to your child and you say, this is how many times you can get out of bed tonight. If your child is getting out of bed 32 times a night, you're probably going to have to give them several bedtime passes. And when you give them a bedtime pass, they're allowed to use it. So what happens is we have to teach them, okay, these are your passes. Let's count them. How many do you have? And, and you say to your child, if you get out of bed, you have to give me one of these. Now, some of you are going to say, my child won't understand that. My child doesn't understand numbers. They're not going to be able to count. It's okay. Because if they get out of bed, what you just say is, where's the pass? And it becomes a, like a ticket exchange. And you'd be surprised the kids get it. If you get out of bed, you have to give me one. And they notice that they're missing because you put them on their bedside table and they, they go, Oh, I don't have as many of those. Right. And then the big deal is, is if they end up staying in bed and, and they have at least one pass left that in the morning we go, Oh, you had a pass left. So you get a treat and it has to be something that is reinforcing to them. It can't be something that's reinforcing to you. It has to be something that's reinforcing to them. So, you know, if you have a kid who loves those little matchbox cars, you go to the store and you get like 20 of them and you stick them in a drawer and, you know, you say in the morning at breakfast, you go, where are your bedtime passes? Do you have any bedtime passes left? And if they come to you and they have bedtime passes left, you go, oh, this is wonderful. Congratulations. You get a car and you trade them the bedtime pass for a car. For the kiddo that loves cars, they'll be like, oh, well, I want to make sure I have at least one of those suckers left on the table every night, right? So it's got to be specific. The reward has got to be specific. But what you do is you very slowly take away so that their starting number of bedtime passes is less. I bet you an ABA provider would say that there's no way that they would want to start with more than 10 passes. Even that I'm having trouble having them picture. But you got to do what's right for you. Because what you're doing is building in their head, it's better for me long term if I stay in bed and have at least one pass left. And I will tell you what happens. The kids hoard the passes. The, what we find nine times out of 10 is that kids want to know that they can get up, but they want the reward more. But they like knowing that if they needed you, they could get up and you wouldn't be mad with them. Now stop and think about that for a minute. If that's the truth, if that's what we see, then what is that born from? That is anxiety. That is, I don't know if I can make it on my own. And since we love our children so much, doesn't that like make your heart ache a little bit? But knowing that they have a pass to get out of bed is enough to clear that anxiety and know that if they really need to, they can get up. That for me felt good as a parent. I was like, oh, I'm helping him to deal with his feelings and I'm giving him an out for his anxiety. So that is what the bedtime pass is. You can pretty much do it with anything that you want, but we did make a template at some point that just says bedtime pass and it had these little tickets and then you would uh, laminate it and Velcro and they would peel off the Velcro and you could put however many bedtime passes you wanted. You can do that. You can make one on your own. It can be made of magnets. It can be made of stuffed animals, you know, whatever works for you and your kiddo. But the idea is that we're, we're constantly winnowing down the number of passes that we get, but we're doing it so slowly that it's not traumatic for them. And we're giving them that out if you need to get up. But here's the thing, when they get up, we, we, you know, we, what do you need? And then we very quickly take them back to bed, spend maybe a minute with them. And we say, okay, you know, I'm taking that bedtime pass and thank you. And da, 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 da. so there's no reprimands for using the bedtime pass. And there is always a reward for having the bedtime pass left in the morning. If you find that they can't make it, um, what we want to constantly be doing is getting to the reward. So if they can't make it till the morning, 
give them an extra pass at the beginning of the night, never in the middle of the night. Make sense? I think Traven just put up the link to the bedtime pass because he's like that because he's so fabulous. Okay. So the bedtime pass, I know it sounds ridiculous. It sounds like it's just more work and that it would never work. That bedtime pass thing works like crazy, like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs crazy. And parents who actually do it and try it always write back to us and go, Oh my gosh, why don't people talk about the bedtime pass all the time? It works like a charm. Da, 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 my life has changed. So, you know, but use it in conjunction with the bedtime ritual. And I think you'll find that it, it has sort of magical properties. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit more about the separation anxiety, because that's a lot of what happens at night. Don't you love all the experts who say, well, you know, we all like to have another warm body or our pet or somebody in bed with us because we don't like being alone in bed. Um, said no mother ever because mothers would kill for time alone in bed. Right. But but the truth is, even when, then we get it, and then we sort of miss all the other people and animals that are in our bed. Right. There's something comforting about having other people in our bed. And we talked about that, you know, if you mimic the breathing, it helps you to sleep better. So, and yet we take our littlest, most precious souls and we say to them, no, you got to figure it out in a bed on your own. Now, you know, this is kind of the deal. And, and it does set them up for success in their life in that they have the capability of, of putting themselves to sleep. There is something to be said for that, right? I think, you know, I know adults who are not able to do this for themselves and and no judgments, right? But life would be better if we all had the, I watch my husband. My husband lays down and he's asleep within like a minute and a half. And for me, it's like chasing a tiger to see if I can catch it. You know what I'm saying? Um, so giving your child good sleep habits that help them to be able to sleep, it's kind of a gift that we give them, but we don't have to do it with a whole lot of anxiety. So I talked a little bit before about how Dr. Grampy Shea has done many shows with us talking about how you just, you just move an inch at a time away from them. And the bedtime pass helps with a little bit of separation anxiety. But I guess what I want to say here is that I think we need to be compassionate about this. And this is where if you are tired, compassion goes out the window. When you're exhausted and you want to go to sleep and your child just wants you, at a certain point we get frustrated, angry, and then we cave and we'll give them anything they want so that we can go back to sleep. So I want to give you two things here. If you're rested enough, you will be more compassionate to your child. And we always want to be compassionate about their need to have something else. Please feel free to give your child something that is safe for them to cuddle in bed so that they don't have to feel that anxiety. I don't think that having a child lay awake all night crying in their own bed by themselves I don't think any of us ever want that for our kids. And I hear experts who are like, just tough it out. Just tough it out. Just, you know, close the door and tell them you're not coming in and leave the room dark. And eh, I'm not about that. I'm about helping them over time. And you know, the example I always use when we do daylight savings time, that the light changes by about a minute and a half every day and we don't notice it. We just don't really notice it until one day we go, oh my gosh, it's eight o'clock at night and it's still light out. Or, oh my gosh, it's 5.30 and it's dark already because it's winter time, you know? And we go, how did that happen? But it's been changing a minute and a half at a time. Then when twice a year, when we spring our head or fall back, and I don't even know if we're even doing that anymore, but now it's changed by a whole hour and we are all like zombies who can't, like more car accidents happen in those two weeks than any other time because we're all weirded out by the shift in the light by an hour. So when we change things for kiddos, we got to do it slow, that minute and a half thing that maybe they can handle, not by the huge leap that we do when we change the clocks. Does that make sense? I hope so. Be kind, be compassionate. Um, isn't it what we would want, how we would want to be um, dealt with? Okay. 
let's talk a little bit about bedwetting because um, one of the other things that happens is that kids wake up in the night and they wet the bed and then it becomes a problem because you're half asleep and you got to change the sheets and you got to make the child stand there or move someplace else. And then they go back to sleep and they don't want to go someplace else. And a lot of times where you put them is in your bed and they're like, Ooh, that's the thing I wanted. We see kids who wet the bed just so that they can get back into mom and dad's bed. And if you realize that you don't have to go through the whole ritual of changing the bed and, and so on and so forth, right? We, we, you know, we can do other things, we can make other choices. So um, one of the things that I, I know some parents do is um, I know they get real creative. First of all, there used to be a set of sheets that you could get. In fact, I knew the guy that invented them, that it, they marketed them for uh, college kids. And I don't know if you can still get them, but they're disposable sheets and they they feel like cloth. They're not horrible. Your child will be able to sleep on it and they're waterproof. So if your child goes to sleep and wets the bed, all you have to do is peel off the top sheet, throw it away, and you're back in business. So if you can find those, that's one thing that parents do. I've seen other parents set up a cot in the bed that's made up with clean sheets so that if the child wets the bed, they put them in the cot and they wait and change the sheets in the morning, right? There's all different kinds of things that you can do. Um, you can still, you, if it's happening on a regular basis, you can put pull-ups on them. If, if that's what you need to do, you can notice what time they're wetting the bed, set your alarm, get up, go in 10 minutes before the time that they normally wet the bed, not really fully wake them up, but motor them into the bathroom, get them on the pot. And then very, soothingly congratulate them when they pee in the pot, not the big party that we would do the rest of the time, take them back to bed and maybe rub their back, their back for a few minutes to get them to go back to sleep. And now you go back to bed, right? That's, these are all different strategies that you can do so that your sleep is minimally affected because that's really the thing with bedwetting is that you, if you're, if what we're working on is not the potty training. What we're working on is the bedtime ritual. What we want to do is if there's a disturbance in the night, whatever it is, we want to get them back to sleep as fast as possible. Right? So I don't know the circumstances in your family or what's happening and why it's happening, but ask yourself, when is it happening? Why do I think it's happening? Is it happening just so that they can get in the bed? Because if that's the case, you want to make sure that they can't get in your bed. It should Wetting the bed should not come with a reward. It should also not come with a punishment. Can we be honest on both sides of that? Uh, okay, I got to move on because we're running out of time here. Okay, so there's other nighttime problems that you might have to deal with. And, and some of the things that we've heard of here at the show, kids who sleepwalk and who will go out the front door and down the highway in the middle of the night. And if it's if you're having those kinds of sleep issues, then you have to make your house Fort Knox and you have to set up video monitors and you might have to set up an alarm that if a door opens, that an alarm goes off and wakes you all up. I know I just said the priority is getting back to sleep and not doing something that's really loud, but you know, safety comes first, right? Um, so do what you have to, to make things safe. If you have a sleepwalker or if you suspect that you have a sleep uh, Walker. Night terrors are a very specific thing. And sometimes our kids just have nightmares, but then they're, and, and that's a really troublesome thing. But then there are absolute night terrors where the kids wake up and they're screaming. It's really important that you start looking at all the things that are going on in your child's life and get professional help if you're having night terrors. If you're having nightmares, um, you know, try to figure out what the night, what caused the nightmare and help your child to be able to, because, you know, your brain tries to work things out in the sleep. That means your child's brain is trying to work something out that's scary to them. So help them during the day to, uh, 
work out, whatever those things are, physical activity works out. But if it's truly night terrors, you really want to get some professional help with that because there might be other stuff going on. Some of you have said that you your kids wake up in the middle of the night poop and smear on the walls. Um, that's partially a potty training issue, but it's also partially a, a, a bedtime issue. Um, and we could talk endlessly about why kids do that. But the main thing is, is that you want to make sure that they don't have the opportunity to. Um, one of the biggest things that I've heard parents say works with the smearing is that you got to get special pajamas that only are able to get out of in the back that they can't reach. They put zippers up the back. Um, and I've even had families that have had to have two clasps on the the back so that the zippers and snaps so that the child can't wiggle out of it themselves. Um, you can do this by getting footy pajamas and they make summer weight footy pajamas and you cut off the feet and you put them on backwards on the child. That way they can't get into the diaper and they don't have the reinforcer of the attention, the feeling, the smell, the taste, whatever it is that's making them want to do that. We just take it off the table. Yeah. Um, and then waking up at a specific time, a lot of you will write in and say, my kid wakes up, you know, every, every night it's at three o'clock and then he's like up, he's awake. And, uh, one of the best advice that I've heard Dr. Grampy Shea say is take a video, take a set up a video camera to run all night to see what happens. And a lot of times what families find out is, oh, that's when the guy who lives in the condo behind you comes home because he's a bartender and his music is playing really loud in his car as he gets out and that wakes up your kid and your kid can't go back to sleep. Um, for some of you, you know, we all sort of love the melatonin thing, but the problem with melatonin is that it only helps you to go to sleep. And sometimes the melatonin wears out and the kids wake back up. Um, but, but what we find for a lot of people is if you up the physical activity during the day, uh, that can help them to sleep longer and stay asleep longer. So there's lots of different things that can be done for that. It's kind of like, I love what, um, what Laurie said, you know, that they've discovered that if their child eats an hour before bedtime, that that kind of holds them because some kids wake up hungry. They're just hungry. Now we always say, you know, don't, um, don't let your child drink right before bedtime, but you know, different kids, different things. Right. And I said at the beginning, if we're working on the bedtime ritual, put a pull up on and let them drink if they're waking up thirsty. And kids will wake up thirsty and with a dry throat. But what they find is that I did that once and look at all the attention I got. And mom came back and rocked me. And so I'm going to be thirsty every night. Yeah. Uh, so we don't want to do that. Uh, so take a look at it. Be a detective. Yeah. And then, in fact, that's some of our last advice for here. If, if all these things are not working. And I, and I ask you always to be honest with yourself and go, did I hold the line? If I said you could only have five bedtime passes, did I give in and say, okay, you can have one more and reinforce them in the morning? And sometimes we do. Stop judging yourself. Just be honest about it. Because if you say it didn't work, my question to you is, did you, did you do all the steps that we talked about? And if you left one out, be adult enough to say, ah, I didn't do the one about the reading and the singing and go back and try that. But if, if you tried everything here and it's still not working and you're one of those people that your kid has been up for six days and you're losing it, you really can't do that by yourself. At that point, you really need help. And we also need to look and see, are there medical issues that are preventing the child from being able to sleep? Think about what would have to be going on with you medically to make you not sleep? We do have kids that have so much gastrointestinal stuff going on that they literally can't rest because they're in too much pain. And I've seen it all too often where parents finally get to the point where they get to the doctor who says, oh my gosh, your child's um, intestines are lined with ulcers. I don't, I, this child has got to be in excruciating pain and then the parent feels so bad. So if you're seeing that you can't get the bedtime ritual, even with all these good sleep habits, 
then don't hesitate. Go and ask for medical review and say, hey, you know, we don't know what's going on. But look for clues. Obviously, kids that rock and put their fist on their stomach, um, you know, if, uh, if you're seeing diarrhea or if you're seeing, you know, black, hard stools, things like that. Those are all clues. Make sure that you're telling the medical professionals about that. But I do want to say to you, don't give up. What I see all too often, especially when we have teens and adults or parents who are like, no, I tried it all. And my child's just never going to be able to sleep. And, and I think that I... I think we can all relate to that kind of thinking because sometimes it's like, well, you know, people just don't get what our circumstances are. And, and that is true. And so your brain's going to tell you, well, that is true, but it doesn't mean that it can't change. And with the right professional, it could change. And there are professionals who specialize in exactly this. So I don't want you to blame yourself if it's not working. I don't want you to blame your child, but I want you to keep looking for the answers. And and do try to get somebody who can at least medically look at your child and see what's going on with them. So I hope that all of that uh, is it or some of it is useful to all of you. Um, but please, I know we didn't get a lot of questions. If you have questions, feel free to write in. Remember, my email is shannon at autism-live.com. We have done other videos with experts who get a little bit more specific about the whys and the wherefores. Remember, I'm just doing the parent-to-parent -parent discussion for the things that make the most sense. Um, I... Uh, Hello, if you need real free, uh, oh, I see. They want us to get more viewers. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, we're getting our viewers the old fashioned way. Uh, but anyway, I hope that this will help you guys. All I can tell you is that when my child was up until three o'clock in the morning, I it was like watching my life go down the toilet because I wasn't slept enough to deal with anything. And my child wasn't slept enough to learn. My child was cranky throughout the day. I didn't say this, but the other thing that we needed to stop doing was giving a nap. And that was really hard because around three o'clock in the afternoon, he was, we had ritualized that and he would go to sleep at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, every day, clockwork, right? And everybody was saying to me, if he can do that, then he can do it at 830 but you got to stop the three o'clock one. And it was so hard because he was so pre-programmed to sleep at three o'clock in the afternoon that we had to schedule something that did not involve the car that kept him awake and alert and whatever. And it was hard. It was really, really hard to keep him awake for that. But I will be honest with you. Once we kept him awake for that and did all the rituals, it, it changed everything. It changed everything. It changed my life. It changed his life. It changed the rate at which he learned. It changed my ability to be there for him. So don't give up. Don't blame yourself. Ask for help. Um, please write in and go, I didn't get this part or Shannon, this one doesn't work for me. Um, because it might be that I didn't explain it well enough. Don't be afraid to ask. All right. We're back tomorrow with Dr. Doreen Grampichet, who is beyond fabulous. So if you have questions, send them in and then we'll give them to her tomorrow. And that will be fun for all of us. I appreciate you being here with me on this journey. I know that you're doing your level best. And you know what we say, si se puede. And we can do this. We can do this absolutely together. We hold hands. So I will be back tomorrow with Dr. Grant Pichet. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.